Hello and welcome to World of Strange. Yes, the penultimate episode of this series. God, I can't believe it's nearly finished already. And we are going to be talking this time about fairies, fey folk, as they call them, spirits of the forest or elementals, whichever you want, whatever term or description you have, we hope to cover it. And uh, I've got three lovely guests with me to talk about this phenomena. Uh, and here, here they are. And so welcome, please. Uh, Jay Arseng. Hello, everybody. Lisa Coronado. Hello. And of course, Jake Wardle. Greetings. <laughs> right. Welcome, one and all. Okay. But before we delve into this, this fairy uh, uh, mystery, as it were, um, we're going to have a random strange fact read out by none other than our friend Jay. Strange facts. So, in Slovakia, they have Christmas carp that live in the family bathtub for a few days before being eaten. Still. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I uh, was uh, certainly didn't know anything uh, about that, but it is it is an interesting uh, it's an interesting tradition to basically keep uh, you know to keep carp in such a <laughs> in such a personal place before, you know, devouring them. Uh, yeah. Also, what if it's your only bathtub? You just don't take a bath for a couple of days? That's a good question. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's, that's really what I want to know is like, are you taking a bath with the carp? <laughs> There's something, something very fishy going on there, that's for sure. <laughs> but that's a hell of a tradition right there. Yeah, you know, you, you really get to know those carp well before you eat them. <laughs> 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 instead, of having, like, instead of having rubber ducks in there, you sw you're swimming with, swimming with carps. Come yeah. on, fish. Swimming with the sharks almost. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas carpy, you're. I didn't even know there was Christmas carp. <laughs> so they got one just specifically for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the the traditional fish to eat in Slovakia for Christmas. Who knew? I don't, I've never eaten carp, so. I haven't either. No, no. It's supposed to be, I don't know. If it, it's, it's a big delicacy over in certain countries, isn't it? Isn't like it the bottom feeder? I thought it was. Yeah, I, I thought it wasn't exactly. Back? Yeah, that's what that was. What I always thought. I didn't think it was a fish that was really at the top of a lot of people's lists as no. a, a delicacy. <laughs> I thought it was a more of like a pond fish for your garden pond. Yeah. They're very big, aren't they big? In, uh, the carp are very big in Japan, aren't they? They're just like a, a, I think, where most people like export, import them over or something from there, or it's tropical I'm carp. Or here. I mean, we've caught carp in the lakes that are here, and we always throw them back. Yeah. They're just gross. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it wouldn't be on your Christmas card list for dinner then? Big, can't they? I'll stick with the prime rib, thanks. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, so there we are, Christmas carp. That's what, that's the next on my shopping list, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll mail you some from uh, uh, Washington. <laughs> oh, thanks, yeah. I, I, I can't imagine what, it's going, what state it's going to be on when it arrives here, though. But anyway. Right? <laughs> <That's> marinated. <laughs> oh, lovely, yeah. <laughs> it's doing in its own juices. Yep. Yeah, it's frying in, in the cargo hold. Yeah, <laughs> becoming <and> bubbling. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, well, there we are. That was our strange fact, um, and you know that is pretty strange. Uh, so now let's get on to the um, the real nitty gritty, and uh, this is something that um, came about because Lisa dropped a dropped a whammy on me by mentioning it, because originally I was I was going to send her just a story you know to read out by someone else, but. Um, Lisa happened to mention when I mentioned the fact that we, the next episode we were going to do is fairies. She immediately said, "Oh, I've got a story for you that happened to me to to Lisa uh, when mm -hmm. you were filming in Ireland, I believe, Lisa." Okay. So um, I thought, "Well, let's drop that story. I want to hear this. <laughs> I'm really intrigued by this." So, Lisa, please tell us about this. Um, what happened to you? Okay. Well, um, my first trip to Europe 
happened to be to Ireland, um, and I'm of Irish descent, so I was pretty excited. Um, and it was summer of 2016. I went over with uh, four people, and we made a film um, in uh, West Cork, Ireland. We were right kind of on the the southern southwestern tip on the on the water, and we were on day five of seven of filming and it's a period piece. So we brought over vintage costumes and we were extremely excited because we were filming on, um, I think it's called Browhead Point and Star Wars had just wrapped. So we showed up on these cliffs and there were all these massive like tractor indentations and set indentations you could see in the grass. And it was so exciting and it was extremely windy and we decided to set up the shot on with myself and uh, my other actress um, on the top cliff while the director and DP went down a level onto a lower cliff. And we were probably, I don't know, 75 feet in the air over the ocean. And uh, we're, we're in the middle of a take and I forgot to hold my hat on my head, my vintage hat, and a gust of wind came and blew my hat off my head. And we still had several days to shoot with this already established wardrobe piece that we could not replicate. <laughs> so the wind took my hat and blew it over the cliff onto the second cliff where the DP and director were and dangled precariously on a ledge. Everybody's freaking out. The director who is deathly scared of heights decided to get on his stomach and try to shimmy down and get it and we were all screaming at him you know because we're 60 feet in the air over jagged rocks and ocean and we all stared at the hat as oh, another gust of wind came blew it up in the air and down it went over the cliff and we couldn't see it anymore and for whatever reason i got really stressed out and really firm and i yelled over the cliff hat you get back here right now and all of a sudden up comes the hat, 75 feet up, and lands at my feet. We don't know how this happened. I basically feel like I talked to the fairies <laughs> and asked for their help because our shoot would have been in so much trouble not having this hat. And, uh, and yeah, that was kind of my, uh, my introduction into a gift from what I believe to be the fairies. <laughs> wow. Good God. That's really lovely, that, yeah. Um, but it could have, it could of course, you know, be let's let's you know, let's use a you know a rational mind here for a moment. It could have just been a freak gust of wind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that blew yeah. it back up. I don't know, but uh, it blew it up seventy five feet right back to me. Right back where you were. <laughs> right where I was. And I was several I was like, I don't know, fifty, sixty feet away from where it had actually gone over the cliff. I it was, yeah, and it, everybody saw it. Coincidence. Yeah, everyone saw it. It saved our shoot. I mean, it was so, it's the most crazy thing that has ever happened to me. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty extraordinary, though. You know? I mean, do you, now, do, you, do you get the feeling that, I mean, it seems like something uh, other was going on to, to bring that hat back to you, but uh, do you think that, uh, whatever was causing that was also what caused it to go over the edge in the first place, you know, that like maybe. fairies were also like causing mischief initially and then brought it back to you. And they I just mean, wanted maybe. to play a big prank on you. <laughs> well, we had shot a couple of days before at a, a cast, an old ruined castle with a haunted lake and we had to take some water from it. And we were really terrified because it was supposed to be a woman that haunted it. Oh, and when I was shooting up in like the ruined castle, every time we called action, the wind blew my skirt up over my head. It was so, <laughs> it, there was no wind the whole other time until we were shooting. Only on felt, like more friends. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> wow. Like are these the ghosts of old soldiers that were at this that think it's super funny? You know, it was, there were many occurrences, but we were wondering, we were like, you know, should we not have taken the water, maybe, from the haunted lake? <laughs> so, it so it wasn't just you then? There were other people that were having, like, uh, mysterious things happening to them as well? No, it was just me. It was, okay. But they singled you out. Around, so, I mean, it, everybody saw it, but I had two, no, I had three, actually. Um, when we 
shot at an old, like 5,000 year old Neolithic tomb in a pasture in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we ended up going back the next day because I wasn't happy with a performance part. And I was like, can we please go back and I can, I can do this. And as we're going back, perched up in a tree was um, the, our host family's umbrella that I guess had got stuck up there. We don't know how. We didn't even know it was missing. And we found it when we went back. I mean, just really random, weird, coincident yeah. things happened in Ireland the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> this island is known, of course, you know, it's steeped in uh, folklore. Yes. Um, you know, and things like that, of fairies and banshees. Have you heard of those? Um, yes. Yeah, another phenomena. Um, and ghosts and all sorts of, you know, strange things happen in Ireland. It's um, always had the mystical kind of vibe about it, you know. That was the theme of the film, and that's why we chose Ireland, because we were ah. thought, where could we get some incredible, not only like um, locations, but just, just the feeling of that, and it definitely delivered. Wow. It, it certainly did, by the sound of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, is, what is this film called? I want to check it out. Yeah, wow. it's super fun. We were in kind of, is it Goline? Galeen, I can't pronounce it, by Skibberdeen. So we were, we drove into Dublin and then, or flew into Dublin and then drove five hours. That's a whole other story. Driving in Ireland is terrifying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because we're on the opposite side of the road, but then, you know, they're 60, well, for us, 60 miles an hour. I don't know how many kilometers an hour. On one lane, windy roads that go around <laughs> like hedges and you can't see. <laughs> Wow. It was crazy. It was an experience. <laughs> Ireland's so beautiful, That's though. I've visited Cork because I've got some relatives over there. <gasps> Just it's mesmerizing. So beautiful. And the food was good. Mm. I've, always wanted, I've always wanted to visit that part of Ireland, uh, uh, Lisa, because my family from Ireland, and, uh, but not, not, the, not, you know, not the coastal side, the west, west coast or anything like that, like Cork or, you know, that, not down that way, but... Um, I would love to visit those places because it's really beautiful out there. Oh know? my gosh, it yeah. was unbelievable. I definitely recommend it, yeah. And, and yeah, again, Galway is where I want to go. Yeah, that is fascinating. <laughs> so there's my fairy story. Yeah. <laughs> they do, yeah, they do say some fairies are actually tricksters and mis mischievous. So, you know, maybe that's the ones you, you, were, you were attracting, Lisa, I guess. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah, they like you. Yeah. 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 Uh, that is the fascinating thing about fairies is that like, yeah, there is this kind of, yeah, like kind of mischievous type of thing. It's like they kind of dance on that trickster line sometimes where it's like, you know, like when they're blowing that hat around on the cliff, like there's, there's real, you know, possibility for danger there, you know, uh, right. with what they're doing. And yet there's also, you know, just uh, real, um, I don't know, just, nice things that they're doing when they bring it back to you and, and whatever. So it's just this weird kind of like, what, what are they after? I don't know. <laughs> I know and I'm usually skeptical and this just felt um, playful trickster. It did. And it didn't feel um, ominous in any way, but it was yeah. definitely something. And I, I couldn't, you know, quite put, explain what it was because I'd never experienced anything like it. <laughs> like, if only Joe can, here's your hat back. <laughs> <laughs> Give you a heart attack. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, we almost killed your director. <laughs> right. That was the other thing. We're like, no. <laughs> yeah, your director's dead, but look, here's your hat. Yeah. Uh, you know, every, every cloud. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, Jay. Could you yeah. please read out the next story? Actually, I'll just give you a little bit of a footnote to this. Um, this was a story, a bit like Lisa's, that was an encounter that happened personally um, by my friend Becky in Canada when she was only seven years old. It's a world of strange. All right, so Becky's story. When I was a little girl, I recall looking out the window one night to see the stars. Over the years, I had spent many nights at that window, gazing at the trees and the night sky in wonderment, and I had never seen anything patently out of the ordinary before or this. It was approximately two or maybe three in the morning, and everyone else was asleep. The house was really quiet as we lived in a rural area. I'd been phasing in and out of sleep for a few hours. I was always a nocturnal child, but I remember eventually waking fully when two of our cats suddenly ran into my bedroom. The cats ordinarily never wanted to sleep with me in my bed. 
in spite of my frequent and persistent attempts to cuddle them at night. For whatever reason, I recall getting a strange, and I would say somewhat eerie feeling right after they entered the room. Something felt very different about that moment, and I somehow wasn't sure whether to be frightened or reverent. Almost instinctively, I rushed to my window. There was a star in the sky that seemed much, much brighter than any I'd seen before. Its rays converged, almost like various depictions of the Bethlehem star I had seen on Christmas cards. Being seven years old, it seemed perfectly logical and natural at the time to assume that this was, obviously, a wishing star. So I got down on my knees and stared intently. I opened my heart and, being seven, wished for a pack of gum, something we rarely had in the house, with replete conviction. <clears throat> Shortly afterward, I recall hearing a strange sound that seemed to originate from just below my window. I've tried many times over the years to describe this noise, but every description seems to fall short. There was something odd about it. And even 23 years later, I still can't seem to explain what I heard. I know this is going to sound somewhat stereotypical, but it almost sounded like a cross between tiny bells and children's laughter. But there was something else in the noise, some nuance that I can't quite explain. I felt what seemed undeniably, irrefutably, to be a presence in that moment. At first, I wondered if a child or a group of children had found their way into the garden. There was a slight sense of mischief about the sound, but it didn't quite remind me of anything I can place. I didn't have very long to think about what I'd heard before I saw what was likely the strangest thing I've ever seen. Something flew past my window. It went from right to left. I don't know where it originated from before that. It looked kind of like two long, sparkling, metallic streamers, but they weren't attached to anything, and they seemed to be emitting light. They shimmered like tinsel or foil, and their paths were very slightly uneven, almost like two little birds or butterflies sailing by. One of them was a deep silver, and the other was bright peacock blue. I stood up and peered down into the garden below, but I couldn't see anything or anyone around. They had disappeared after they'd crossed my window, and there was no sign further of them. At the time, my immediate assumption was that I'd seen two shooting stars, a thought which greatly delighted me. I didn't really piece together the evidence until a few years later. The things were moving slowly, and their paths were moving up and down. More than this, they went between my window and a nearby tree. They weren't in the atmosphere, that's for sure. Of course, seeing two comets, seeing two comets together, one silver and one blue, would also have been a little strange. The strange events didn't stop there, and in some ways they have continued to occur even to this day, but that was definitely one of the weirdest encounters I've had. I'll finish by saying this. The following morning, I found a new, unopened pack of bubble gum on my bedside table. In some ways, I kind of regret not wishing for something more substantial than gum, but my enduring belief in the mystery of it all was a better present. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> that's sweet that is just i just thought that was lovely that the only you know a seven-year-old the only thing she wished for was a pack of gum you know yeah. 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 <laughs> i could totally see myself doing that yeah. <laughs> i mean that was gum was like a rare thing as well for us so i i, I that would have been at the top of my list <laughs> she said to me afterwards when she sent that story she said um i wish I'd, at the time i'd thought about asking for world peace <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you know, at that age, oh, she's probably not going to mind. You know. Oh, that's yeah. sweet. That's a really great story, and it was really well written. Yeah, she's yeah. very. She's a good writer, actually. Yeah. Um, she would have gone on a lot longer than that. I had this sort of because I never knew how much time we had. So I said, you know, she said, "How long do you want me to write? Or how many experiences do you want me to write about?" Because she's actually had more than one. Oh gosh. Um, yeah, that still happen even to this day, apparently. Um, but that one was just like very impactful for a young, you know, for a young kid, you know. Well, part of Canada, what's that? What, um, well, British, Colum British Columbia, somewhere. Oh, I mean. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's yeah. yeah. That's another thing on my. That's another thing on my uh, to places to go list. You know, parts of Ireland and uh, Canada, I think as well. I'd love to see, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Especially if, uh, you know, they have wish-granting fairies over there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Over there, stock up on everything you want. Yeah. Thanks, I mean, we've, we've heard Lisa's story, now Becky's story, uh, and I, I, you know, it, it just kind of makes me wonder, it seems like there's something that, 
you know, for whatever reason, kind of uh, a fairy sort of finds you and, uh, you know, kind of, like it sounded like when you were, when you were over in Ireland, uh, you were kind of being affected constantly. Like they kind of, you know, found you and kind of attached to you somewhat. And uh, certainly Becky has had like these experiences now, not just this one, but, but throughout her life. Um, and yeah, it just makes you wonder like, what, uh, what is it about that? That just, they find, you know, it's not like, Oh, here's some random encounter and, and that's it. You know, it's like, they kind of, uh, you know, they find you and they're not just, uh, they're not just one and done with you necessarily. You know, they want to, uh, they, they keep, uh, they keep attaching themselves to you. It's kind of like that, uh, the, the, something, something is true in that whole Peter Pan type of thing, you know, where you kind of, you, you, there's a fairy and they kind of, they, 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 uh, they like you. They want to keep hanging out with you. I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'd be interested to go back and see if I had the same experience. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, make make, make sure you bring a hat with you, uh, Lisa. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We're bringing, if we shoot there, <laughs> we're bringing duplicates. Yeah. <laughs> I also wondered if it if it happens to uh, if it happens to guys or if it's just uh, if they're if they're more if, if fairies are more uh, drawn towards women. I don't know. Mm, interesting. That is a good. Interesting point, Jay. I really don't know. Um, you know, none of that. But, um, or about um, guys. So. What's that? I'm not, I'm not seeing much. Guys. So uh -huh. you don't really hear it as much. You don't. You don't. Uh -huh. Funny enough. No, that's right. Um, I, I dare say it must happen, or must have happened at some point, you know, but uh, you just don't read, see many stories about that. Um, mm -hmm. It does tend to be, it does tend to be women, or more more of, well, often than not, you, you know, young young kids, you know, young girls. Yeah. Uh, um, they visit them in, and when they're kids, you know. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's an odd one. Um, but Jake, you have a little bit of, um, a little bit of info um, for us about uh, talking about young girls again uh, uh, um, this story was made into a movie called fairy tale a true story in 1997 um, based on this account that happened um, so Jake could you um, tell us a bit more about that yeah so this is the uh, the cottingly fairies story um, in July 1917 16-year-old Elsie Wright and her 10-year-old cousin, Francis Griffiths, were, uh, were tired of being chided by Elsie's father over their claims of seeing fairies. So they took a photograph of some to prove their existence. The girls lived together in Cottingley on the outskirts of Bradford, West Yorkshire, England. They often played together in the small wooded creek behind Elsie's home. And this is where they saw the fairies. On a day in July, Elsie, tired of her father's dismissive attitude to her and Francis's claims, borrowed her father's camera to take a picture. When the film was developed later in her father's dark room, Elsie's parents were in for a surprise. The picture she had taken was of Francis with a troop of fairies dancing in front of her. Elsie's parents were flabbergasted, but her father wasn't convinced. So a month later, Francis took a picture of Elsie, which clearly showed her playing with a gnome. Mr. Wright still wasn't convinced, and there the matter settled. The girls showed the pictures to their friends, but no particular interest was ever raised by them, at least not until two years had passed. Elsie's mother had developed an interest in things supernatural and took the pictures to share with a the theosophist meeting in Bradford, one evening. In no time at all, the pictures were the centre of attention and argument. Of the people who believed fairies were real, the most prominent and vocal was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes. Sir Arthur printed the first two pictures in Strand magazine in 1920 to help support his argument for the existence of fairies. This article made the story a worldwide sensation. In 1920, Sir Arthur arranged for Elsie and Francis to once again be given a camera and left on their own in the small creek. The results were three more photos of the fairies, the last to be made, for shortly after this photo session, Elsie and Francis moved away from one another and stopped seeing fairies. Sir Arthur later printed these three pictures in a sequel to his earlier article, and in 1922, he explained the two articles he expanded the two articles into a book, The Coming of the Fairies. 
That was quite actually a very, very famous story. Um, and yeah, those pictures are being going doing the rounds everywhere, you know. I yeah. could have sworn um, that film was playing on the TV at some point when I was a kid. It, it rings a bell. Yeah. The the yeah. I remember yeah. hearing about that one as well. It, even Houdini uh, met the children as well, and the, and some royalty as well. They got, they really met some famous people through the through these pictures. Yeah. They became kind of minor celebrities in this tiny little them. Yorkshire town. And the father didn't like, um, or the uncle didn't like, um, all the attention that was being drawn to the house and the you know and all that because everyone was coming down there and hounding him and everything and hounding you know paparazzi in this very sleepy little town and it kind of upset everything you know and. Um, I heard though, I don't know where I heard this, but I heard that um, they were forced to admit that it was a fake or something. Yeah, apparently years later, they were, they, there were some interviews with them as when they were older women on YouTube later on when they were interviewed about that. Uh, and uh, sometime in the early 80s, I think they were interviewed. And um, um, they had said that um, there was five photos taken and four of them were fake. But the very last one, Frances said, maintained to the end of her life that that one's that one was a real one. Huh. That's that's funny. It's like, yeah, we weren't f uh, we, we we were faking the the four, but we're not the last one. That was real, honest. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that that does kind of hurt credibility a little bit. It's it like, well, we were trying to do fake ones, but we accidentally did a real one. Yeah, right? Accidentally. <laughs> I yeah. guess we attra attracted the real ones. Yeah. <laughs> the fake ones were their friends. Or but they had, they, had, they had said all along that they believed in fairies and that there were fairies there, you know, mm. when, they went th when they went there. But, of course, photographs, um, they were a bit more, obviously a bit more difficult to capture than what was presented to the public, you know? Yeah. But also that required a lot of, um, I mean, to fake those photographs, especially in those days, it required a lot because... Obviously, it's not like you could just snap out a, a phone and Photoshop something onto it, you know. No. Like, you mm -hmm. know, 19, 1917, it's like during the First World War, you know, that's a, over a century ago. You know, there was a, a lot more to, to photo technology that you had yeah. to do to, to be able to make something like fake. Mm -hmm. So there, there, a lot of effort was obviously put into it. Yeah. Well, the little figures, the, the little um, fairies, the little fairy figures were actually apparently uh, uh, um, cut cut out of a book, mm. and uh, like cardboard cutouts, and they were probably put little standees, little things behind them to support support them, mm. little sticks or something to stand up right, um, and that's apparently how they did it, you know. It seems very, it seems very fairy like for the uh, for fairies to actually mess with those fake photos. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and throw themselves into one for real while they're doing all that. <laughs> that is the ultimate photo bomb. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Can we see those photos? Are those like archived online? Yeah. Oh yeah. They're, yeah, they're actually in the in the story I'm reading from. <laughs> they look good. They're, they're embedded into the text. Yeah, does they are. Yeah. yeah. Like, does it look real? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> no, they like don't. They don't really. They don't. <laughs> back, they look real. I guess back, back then, you know, obviously, people had a different perspective, so it probably might have looked real to people back then. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably more so. Uh, um, Lisa, you have a strange fact for us. I do. Strange facts. It took the creator of the Rubik's Cube, Erno Rubik, one month to solve the cube after he created it. Yeah, and apparently the, the one of the world records was 4.22 seconds. Uh, oh, jeez. Really? Yeah. <laughs> How? I can't even get it one rotation in four seconds. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> if he created it, shouldn't it have already been, like, pre-solved? I guess, in, in the design. He well, you would have thought so, yeah. So, you know, the fact that the creator of it took a month to, fit to actually solve it is quite funny when you think that someone actually could do it in, like, four and a half seconds. You know? Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> I just randomly make it. it and say, all right, I'm going to test to see if I can solve this. I don't have yeah. the patience for that one. Hmm. It's, that's always kind of, you can almost do a whole show on that, like, people that, like, create things that they themselves are not able to 
to do, you know, like that kind of thing just fascinates me. I remember uh, a little, this is a while back, but like the Billy Joel at one point decided that he wanted to get into writing classical music, but like he would write pieces that were so difficult that he himself couldn't play them, you know? So it's like this kind of thing where like you're creating something that you, you created it and yet you can't do it. And it's like, I don't know, it's just kind of a mind bender to me to think that like, it's that same kind of thing with the, the Rubik's cube. It's just like, well, well sometimes I, I, I made it, but I can't do it. <laughs> sometimes I've written scripts for my like YouTube videos and other projects I've done. And then I, I can't bloody remember them and I keep messing up and I'm like, I wrote this. <laughs> How can I keep stuffing this up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny it that, that it happens, but, yeah. you know, you know, my 67 accents video on YouTube. Yeah. I made yeah. another video after that of the outtakes and it's longer than the actual video. <laughs> and it's all stuff. It's all self. -written. I wrote the whole thing. Like, the, I wrote, everything and uh yeah I just kept messing up and it was so funny i, I made another video just about takes <laughs> so i can kind of relate to it in in that sense with scripts yeah <laughs> <laughs> well we are more or less i think we are done aren't we guys i think we've read everything out uh, well yeah. you have rather um yeah so that's that, that's amazing because i didn't think we'd we get it all in, but we did. That's brilliant. Um, okay, just a few minutes late, but pretty cool, you know, considering. Um, so so we're getting good at this. We're, we're getting good at this, man. Yeah, even though we did it a half hour late, we still got it all done. <laughs> Listen, a fairy magic so we, we could have had an hour, you know, but this when we got that, it turned out right, really. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. Um, so yeah, good, good, good thing there. Um, so. Guys, thank you so much for joining me on this. So let's let's thank my friends here, um, J.R. Seng, uh, Lisa Coronado, and Jake Wardle. Thanks so much. Thank you, Frank. It's fun. Yeah. And as always. And thanks everyone for listening and tuning in again. And yeah. we, of course, will see you all again for the very last World of Strange um, series coming up. And this is the one that we were speaking about before. Uh, I think Lisa and Jake were on the last show. And I was going to do a different topic, but when we spoke about um, the, um, you know, the multi-universes and parallel universes. Oh, yeah. I thought, well, let's, let's, let's do that. Um, so I hopefully we'll get a, a, a lot of you on the last one. That would be really cool. Um, and we can talk about that in depth. Yeah. Yes. So that will, be, that will be the next one. So I hope you guys will also join us then, and I hope you enjoyed this. And until then, of course, sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs>